Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, or demand its own way, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong, it will not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, or demand in some way, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong, it will not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth, and that's love. is kind, it does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, or demand in some way, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong, it will not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all, believes all, love hopes all, in the bears all believes all the hopes all endorse all that's love real love and that's love you gotta give it it's love real love you gotta live it it's love real love love is patient love is kind it does not envy or boast it is not arrogant or rude, or demand in some way. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. It will not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And that's love, real love. That's love, you gotta give it its love. Love. You gotta live it, it's love, real See you open up the floodgates, a mighty river. 
Show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Joshua uh, chapter 24 uh, verse 15 it says and if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord we live in a, a country that doesn't make it illegal to serve whatever God you want um, we have so many influences all around all the time. We have crazy stuff happening in politics where you can believe just about any crazy thing you want and other people have to support you. And um, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose for yourself this day. I think that every day we make the choice when we wake up, are we going to worship God with our lives and our choices and our day-to-day, moment-by-moment actions and, and thoughts? Or are we going to just start following the world, following this way, following that way? Well, it's okay if they want to do that. No, it's not okay. They're going to do it, and we can love them anyway, but it's not okay. You know, we can choose to serve the Lord and represent Him moment by moment, day by day, through everything we do. So today I just, I don't know, think about that. Who, who will you choose? How will you remember to stay on course and not get dragged by the strong voices of this world? to worship I choose to bow though there's pain in the offering I lay it down here in the conflict when doubt surrounds though my soul is unraveling I choose you now I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my song. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my song. Build my altar right here and now. In the midst of the darkest night, it won't burn out. For you are perfect, no matter what. In the joy of the suffering, I sing it loud. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my soul. When the enemy says I'm done, I lift my praises. When the world comes crashing down, I lift my praises high. 
I own a small business and um, I'm at a crossroads in my mind because it's so easy to hide. It's easy to be a, we're a commercial furniture company. It's easy to be a commercial furniture company, but is it, e but is it easy to be a commercial furniture company that glorifies God and publicly states it, puts it on the front of the building, does something like that. And I've actually talked to two different business people over the years and um, they always discouraged me from doing such things, saying that it just creates extra trouble for your business so you shouldn't do it if you want to be successful. And if you're going to choose God or success, which one should you choose? Is there success if there's not God? So um, at this point it's how. How do we go about making this a public thing that everybody we run into every day of the week. I mean, some people don't have the privilege of being themselves in their job. They're asked to be more um, state. I used to be a teacher and they wouldn't let me say what I believe. The kid had to ask first. And now all that training of those eight years in the school has put me in a place where I'm trying to decide how do you be a Christian in the real world where you get to make actual choices again. And uh, it's such a fun thing. So if you want to pray for me, you can just ask God that he would show me the right way to do that. Because I don't want to make people um, afraid or confused or anything else, but just to be a simple representative that they have an opportunity to talk to me to get to know the God of heaven. And what a cool thing that would be for them and for us. So maybe God's calling you to the same thing in your life and you're struggling with the same thing. How do you represent God? But all I know is that he will give you the right thing at the right time and it's just your time to step out and follow. So let's just pray and see if God can show us how to follow right now in this time, in this place, in this country, that we can be everything he's called us to be. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow All your ways are good All your ways are sure I will trust in you alone Higher than my sight High above my life I will trust in you alone Cause where you go, I'll go Where you stay, I'll stay When you move, I'll move I will follow you Whom you love, I'll love How you serve, I'll serve If this 
this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, light into the world, light into my life. I will. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow. And where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll life I lose, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. yeah. Amen. Why don't you just pray with me, Lord? We pray that you lead and that we would be smart enough to see where you're going, that we could follow. Lord, I pray that you give us the grace to know your next step, that we would step out in faith, even if we don't know where it's going or how it will land, but that we'll know we should step. Lord, we just thank you for this great country that we live in, that we do have the freedom to be who you've called us to be. Lord, I just pray that we, um, each day, will look to you, and that no matter the circumstance or the political climate or anything else, we'll say, Lord, today, I choose to follow you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that you give us in this place, in this church, in this, this time of life, to be your example to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Cross trainers, those of you headed to Children's Church, you can head to the back and meet your teachers back there. And uh, Pastor Dan, it's all yours. You know, I mentioned today was Valentine's Day. The truth is that you and I are all engaged in the greatest love story in all of history, aren't we? God's love for man. He sent his son Jesus to earth to die, to reconcile us to him. That is the greatest love story ever told, ever told. Lord, as we open your word together now, just ask that your spirit will speak to our hearts and lives and just encourage us in, in our ministries as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, did I ask you to turn to Colossians? I don't know if I did that or not. But anyway, we're in the book of Colossians, um, chapter 1 today, wrapping up chapter 1. I have been involved in ministry in churches now uh, on staff in one way or another for 44 years since the age of 20. I got married, we moved into, uh, on paid staff that is, we got married, I got married, we moved into a little cottage in the back of our church and became the youth pastor, music director, and church custodian all at once for $300 a month. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> and plus, both of us were going to school at the same time. Anyway, so I was part-time for five years, 
full-time for 39 years. Of those 39 years, four were as an associate pastor and 35 now as a senior pastor. In all those years of ministry, my goal has always been the same. Whether in youth ministry, worship ministry, or as a senior pastor, the goal is to build the kingdom of God by leading unbelievers to faith in Jesus Christ and by building believers to maturity in Jesus Christ. And, and so in light of that goal, it's always very exciting to see people come to know Christ as Savior. There is nothing better than leading someone to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That is just the most exciting thing there is. And then the second to that, or maybe the same, is to watch them grow in their faith. And so it's always been my great joy to watch people grow and mature in Christ as well in their faith. At the same time, there are other times when my heart is broken as I watch people fall away and even walk away from the Lord. Or when people that you pour your lives into they just don't seem to catch it. They don't seem to grow in their faith. And instead, they resort to worldly and fleshly ways of living and doing things, whether in life or in ministry. Today, we come to a passage that has really been my, my key verse in ministry for all of those years. And not only my key verse, but probably a key verse for many pastors in ministry as well. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 through 29 says this, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. We're working our way through the book of Colossians, the series we've entitled Alive in Christ. And that's really the goal, to watch people just come alive in Jesus Christ. So today we're talking about ministry matters. Ministry matters. Verses uh, 28 through 29, the re verses I just read, they don't stand alone. They are in the context. Paul is talking in, in this context about ministry. He was prompted to talk about ministry from the last verse that we talked about last week. It's funny how, how as Paul writes, one thing leads to another, leads to another, and another, and it just kind of keeps on going and going and going. So he started off in verse 15, laying out the case for the supremacy of Christ. Christ is supreme because of who he is. He is the image of the invisible God, and he's also supreme because of what he has done. Uh, through his death on a cross, he reconciled man, reconciled us, reconciled you and me to God. Well, he concluded his discussion about reconciliation by reflecting on his own calling to preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Christ and reconciliation to God. Well, since he's talking about reflecting on, he's reflecting here on his ministry in the gospel, that prompts Paul now to discuss his ministry for a bit. Even though he has not actually had the opportunity to minister to the believers in Colossae himself, he has, in fact, ministered to others who have ministered to the believers in Colossae. But he's very much involved in the ministry of all the Gentile churches uh, around the Roman Empire at this time. So the context is verses 24 through 29. Let's read it, the whole passage. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. In this passage, we simply see Paul's perspective on ministry, his attitude toward ministry, his focus in ministry, his goal in ministry, as well as his source of energy for ministry. That ministry. So let's just kind of look at those things. First of all, Paul's attitude toward ministry, verses 24 through 25. There are four key words here that describe Paul's attitude as he serves the Lord. The first is rejoice, rejoicing. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Paul is simply practicing what he preached here. 
okay? There are several passages in some of his epistles that talk about rejoicing. For instance, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says, Be joyful always. Give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good times, the bad times as well. Rejoice in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. We might want to sing this one. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Again, always. Not just when life is going great, but always. And so even though Paul is sitting in prison as he's writing this letter, he's still rejoicing. And even though he is suffering for his faith in Christ, he's still rejoicing. Even though he's suffering for the believers in Colossae and the believers elsewhere around the empire, Roman Empire, he is still rejoicing. Which brings us to the second term, and that is suffering. Verse 24 goes on and says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. You notice there's no hint at all of self-pity on the part of Paul, is there? He is rejoicing in the privilege of suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I don't really like suffering. I don't like pain. I don't like pain and agony. I don't like being sick. I don't like any kind of suffering. Do you? No. So how could Paul say that he's rejoicing in suffering? It's a matter of focus. It's a matter of perspective, okay? See, Paul isn't focused here on himself. He's focused on three things outside of himself. First, he's suffering because of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples in John 15 they should expect to suffer persecution. If the world hated Jesus, well, they will certainly hate Jesus' followers as well. In fact, we are certainly beginning to see that. A lot in our own country, aren't we? We see the persecution of the church, persecution of Christians today in our country. It, not just in other countries around the world, but it's coming right here to America. But think about it. Why would we expect anything else? If we are truly following Jesus Christ, well, they hated Jesus, so they're going to hate us too. So we would expect persecution. We should expect some suffering for Jesus Christ. Peter tells us that a Christian should never suffer as a thief or an evildoer, but, but that it is an honor to suffer for Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes that it's a, there's a special blessing for those who are persecuted for the sake of Christ. And so Paul here is simply rejoicing that he, in that he can count it that he's counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. That's first. Secondly, he's also suffering because of the Gentiles. He's called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He's a prisoner right now in Rome because of his ministry to Gentiles, his preaching the gospel. In fact, while he's in prison, you know what he's doing in prison? He's continuing to share the gospel with the Romans, the guards that are guarding him. In fact, it's very likely that many of the guards came to know Christ as Savior, and it went all the way up into Caesar's family as well. Believers in Colossae have every reason here to be thankful for Paul's ministry and his suffering on their behalf. So he's suffering because of Christ. He's suffering because of the Gentiles. He's also suffering for the sake of Christ's body, the church. For the sake of the body, it says at the end of verse 24, which is his church. Paul was once the one who was persecuting the church, persecuting Christians, killing Christians, causing great suffering on the church. Now that he's devoted his life to Jesus Christ, and he's caring for and building up the church, he's now on the receiving end of that persecution, all for the sake of the body of Christ, for the sake of believers. And so he's rejoicing in his suffering. His third attitude we see there is that he considers himself a servant. Verse 25, I have become its servant, servant of the gospel, that is, servant of the church. He claimed in verse 23 to be a servant of the gospel. In verse 25, he claims, five, he claims to be a servant of the church. Now think about it. Since Christ is the head of the church, 
Paul is first and foremost then a servant of Jesus Christ, called to minister to the body of Christ. As ministers of the gospel, that is exactly what our calling is, to serve, not to lord it over people, but to serve people. We are servants, we are not CEOs, we are not presidents of a company, but we are servants of the people. Just this week, in fact, I was reading of another very well-known pastor who is basically living in the lap of luxury. Three homes, over a half a million dollar salary every year from church and other ministries, plus, in addition to that, lots of royalties on several books that have been written. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't believe that ministers are called to people are that ministers are called to live in poverty, not at all. But he's also not called ministers to live in the lap of luxury either. We are called to be servants, servants of Christ, servants of the gospel, servants of the church, serving God's people. Peter warns against greed as a servant of the Lord. And so we are to be servants of the Lord. His fourth attitude is that of a steward. Verse 25 goes on and says, I become its servant by the commission God gave me. Paul was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles. Now the word commissioned there is the word oikonomios in the Greek, uh, which is also translated in other places as administration or management. It comes from two Greek words, oikos, and nomos, which means house law. And so the word that's used of a chief steward in a household entrusted with the management or the administration of the master's household. Paul is given a trust here by the master of the household, the master of God's house. And he is a faithful steward of that trust. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 says, he, So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. And now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. We've all been entrusted with the gospel, haven't we? We are all stewards of the gospel. The only question remains is, are we being a faithful steward of the gospel? I appreciate Seth's desire in his business to be a faithful steward of the gospel. That should be all of our attitudes, not just in ministry, but in every walk of life, we are called to be faithful stewards of the gospel. Well, Paul certainly had the right attitude as a minister. He rejoiced in the privilege of suffering for Christ and serving Christ. He counted a privilege to suffer for Christ. He had a servant's heart. He has a steward's perspective. Which brings us then to verses 25 through 27, Paul's focus in ministry. And he mentions three different aspects of ministry here that all lead up to his ultimate goal, which is Christ in you. Verse 25, he says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So that's the first aspect of his ministry, the word, the word of God. And he says to present the word in its fullness. The idea is that of laying out God's word fully and completely. See, people cannot know Jesus Christ better. They cannot grow in their faith Without knowing scripture, preaching God's word was the heart and the soul of Paul's ministry, proclaiming the truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel. In the years that I've been in ministry, I have made it a point to preach and to teach God's word personally. I, I preach mostly through books of the Bible, as we're doing right now, going through the book of Colossians, but even when we do topical series, they are always grounded in scripture. And I sought to keep God's word central in all the ministries of our church as well. In every ministry that we do, God's word is to be central. Because he's not going to grow in Jesus Christ apart from God's word. Now there have been people who want to get together for fun and fellowship and, and not really do Bible study. And, and I have nothing against fun and fellowship. I, I like fun and fellowship. But a lot. But if it's going to be a ministry of the church... God's word needs to be central because this is what it's all about. This is how we grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. So 
He starts off with the word, and then he builds on that, and he talks about the mystery. Verse 28, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Do you like mysteries? My wife loves a good mystery. She likes to try to figure out all the clues and solve it before you get to the end, you know, see if she's right. And she usually does a pretty good job. Me, I like to read the end of the book first to know how, how you, and then figure out how you get there, okay? I, that, we're, we're just a little bit different that way. But the word mystery here in the, in the Greek refers to a, a, a biblical mystery is a little bit different. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. It speaks of something that was once hidden in the past, but has now been revealed in the present. Here, in this case, it is the mystery of including the Gentiles in God's kingdom. You see, in the Old Testament, the Jews were God's chosen people. And there was no hint in the Old Testament whatsoever of this thing called the church. It's just not there. But in the New Testament, God now includes Gentiles in his kingdom. See, God's grace was once proclaimed only among Jews. They were supposed to proclaim it uh, throughout the world, but, but now it's proclaimed far and wide among Jews and Gentiles alike. And so Jews and Gentiles are united now in the body of Christ called the church. That's the mystery. Not revealed in the Old Testament, but now fully revealed. And what is that mystery? Paul explains it as Christ in you. That's the, the goal. That's the focus he's getting to, Christ in you. To them, God has chosen to make known among Gentiles the riches of, his, of this glorious mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. The mystery is that Christ now dwells among and within Gentiles. Not just Jews, but Gentiles. Gentiles are anybody that's not a Jew. And so these Gentiles have now been reconciled to God. They've received forgiveness of sin. They're included in the riches of God's grace. They are included in the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ now lives in them through the indwelling Holy Spirit, filling them with hope. Can you imagine? That's exciting news for the Gentile believers anywhere, but in Colossae as well. You see, once they were outside the covenant of God... Now they are members of God's family. Once they were living in spiritual ignorance and truth, now they are alive in Christ. Once they had no hope, now they have a glorious hope of future in heaven because Jesus Christ now lives within them. And if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have Christ in you as well. And Christ in you gives you hope, the hope of a glorious future as well. The word, the mystery, Christ in you. Which brings us then to Paul's goal in ministry, verse 28. We proclaim him, Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. First, he discusses the process, proclamation and teaching. The word proclaim, Paul's primary method is simply proclamation, preaching, the gospel. But what I want you to see is a couple of things here in this. Notice the change in the pronoun. He's been talking in the first person all along. All of a sudden, in this verse, he changes to the third person. We. Not just himself. We proclaim Christ. And so I'm sure he includes in that Epaphras and Philemon, who have led the Colossian believers to the Lord. But he probably includes anybody and everyone who is proclaiming the gospel as well. We proclaim him teaching and admonishing. And then notice also the subject of his proclamation. The subject is Jesus Christ. We proclaim him. We proclaim Christ. I gotta be honest with you. There are a lot of things that are proclaimed in churches today that are not necessarily Christ. You know, we have th things like five keys to happiness and three secrets to good relationships and how to have a great marriage and how to be good parents and how to do this and how to do that, how to be healthy and wealthy and wise and all this stuff. And there's a lot of truth 
In the Bible, it relates to all those things. But apart from Jesus Christ, they are nothing. Jesus is where it all starts. Jesus is central. And so our proclamation must always have the the object of Jesus Christ. We proclaim him. If we do not preach Christ and Christ crucified, it is all worthless. And not just preaching, but now admonishing and teaching. Admonishing refers to warning and correcting believers, teaching to instructing and training believers in the life of Christ. Admonishing is more the the negative aspect, telling you what not to do. And and teaching is more the positive activity, telling you what to do, how to live in Christ and, and as followers of Jesus Christ. So that's the process. And what's the goal? The goal is spiritual maturity, to present everyone perfect in Christ. The word perfect does not necessarily refer to perfection as in an absence of sin, no sin at all, but it literally means complete or mature. And so Paul's goal in ministry is to see people growing to maturity in Jesus Christ. So what is spiritual maturity? It's not just head knowledge. It's not just information. It's it's not just learning all this Bible trivia, okay? That's not... Spiritual maturity, per se. But maturity goes a little deeper than that. It's a change of attitude. It's a change of character. It's a change of my heart. Exemplified, of course, in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, which is a classic description of Christ-likeness. And so spiritual maturity is growing to become like Jesus Christ. You know, one of the frustrations that I have in ministry, as I said, I've been preaching for over 35 years as a senior pastor, but one of my frustrations is that spiritual growth is sometimes really difficult to see and to measure. You know, you can measure the success of a building program, and I've been involved in three, three building programs, I believe, and you can measure the success of that pretty well. But it's a lot harder to measure the success of a spiritual building project, building godly lives. How do you measure spiritual growth? How do you know if people are really growing spiritually? Yet, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity has been the goal for the past 44 years and will continue to be the goal. It's still my goal. I want to see people growing in Christ. I want you to be growing in Jesus Christ, growing to maturity. I encourage you to come back next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about what is this thing called spiritual maturity. But that's the goal, to present believers perfect, mature in Christ. So I hope that you are growing to maturity in Christ. We'll come back to that in a bit. But first, Paul's energy for ministry, verse 29. He says, to this end I labor, Struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. First thing I see there is that ministry is hard work. Paul used two words to describe the work of ministry. Labor, which means to toil, to to work hard, to exert oneself, whether physically or mentally or emotionally. And then the word struggling, which is the word in, in in the Greek from which we get derive our English word agonizing. And so Paul is agonizing, he's striving, he's struggling to finish this task of building people to maturity in Christ. Now anyone who has spent any time in ministry knows that it requires hard work and long hours. And I know that many people think that pastors only work on Sundays. And so I kind of go along with that. And I tell people, hey, I'm free during the week, I only work on Sundays, so I just kind of go along with that. But if you were to ask my kids and my wife, they would tell you, no, that ain't true. It just isn't true. In fact, for a while, I kept track of my hours at my last church, how many hours I worked, just in case someone ever asked if I was being lazy or whatever, and so I could show them. Let's just say that I worked way too much. Ministry, the point is that ministry is not for lazy people. You don't go into ministry so you can work one day a week. That just isn't it. It doesn't work. But the good news is that we don't have to do it in our own strength. We do it in his energy. 
struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Yes, it is hard work. But our energy for ministry comes from the Lord. We dare not resort to uh, trying to work in our own strength, in our own energy, or we will fail every time. We'll just burn out. We have to rely on Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit to energize us with his power. And that's what Paul is doing. And that's what anybody involved in ministry does. Not just full-time ministry, but even whatever the ministry is. Even on your jobs, you should be relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to energize you in everything you do. So what is all this, how does all this apply to us? Let me just draw two applications from this passage. He's talking about ministry here. First of all, an application related to the goal of ministry. What is his goal? He's proclaiming and teaching. What's the goal of proclaiming and teaching God's word? Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, that you might become mature in Jesus Christ. So since that's the goal, I want to just ask you to take a minute and evaluate your own spiritual life. Like I said, it's hard to measure. It's hard to, to, to discern if people are growing spiritually. So I want to just ask you to, to just think about your own life. Are you growing spiritually? Not just learning more Bible trivia. Are you, are you growing more and more in love with Jesus every day? For instance, are you more in love with Jesus today than you were, say, a year ago today? Do you long to spend time with Jesus in his word and in prayer? Are you becoming more like Jesus? Is that fruit of the Spirit popping out of your life? Do others see Jesus in you? Has Jesus changed your attitudes in any way? Has Christ in you impacted your lifestyle, your relationships, your reactions to people? Are you growing spiritually? Some of you have been listening to me now for 15 years. That's how long I've been here. I hope that you've grown in the last 15 years. And I hope that you are all still growing in Christ. But you need to evaluate your life. Are you growing in Christ? The second application is this. The passage is about ministry. But I want to ask you, are you involved in serving Christ and serving other people in the body of Christ? The Christian life is not for spectators. It's for participants. It's for people to be involved. And so as I look around here today, I see a lot of people who have been Christians for a while, a long while. And I trust and pray that you're not just coming and warming a few, but that you are engaged in the game. The Christian life is not for spectators, it's for participants. So I want to just encourage you to get involved, to be in the game. You don't have to be a preacher, you don't have to be a teacher like Paul. God calls us all to different ministries. So whatever your area of giftedness, your talents, your abilities are, God simply asks you to use those for his glory. But whatever it is, whatever the, the ministry is, the goal is still the same, to see people growing to maturity in Jesus Christ. Even if you're in some of the behind-the-scenes kinds of ministries, the goal is still always the same, to see people growing to maturity in Jesus Christ. So two questions for you. Are you growing spiritually? And are you serving Jesus Christ by serving his body, the church? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the challenge of your word today. Lord, I just pray that everyone here continues to grow in Christ, mature in Christ. And Lord, also that everyone would be involved in ministry for Christ, serving people in the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for this family, this church family, and for the people here. And just pray that you will continue to minister to each one. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Why don't you stand and let's close together just singing that we could find God's call in our lives and follow it. Dismissed. Go and follow Christ.